Welcome to Medfield TV. Today we are conducting the first interview in our series to introduce the three candidates who are running for representative to the 9th Norfolk District to the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Sean Dooley, Republican candidate, Edward J. McCormick, the third, Democratic candidate, and Chris Timson, Independent candidate. The special election is for six towns. In Medfield, this election is for precincts three and four only. The special election primary is on Tuesday, December 10th, and the special election general election is on January 7th. This program has been organized by the Medfield League of Women Voters. They have sponsored this initiative to engage Medfield High students in the process of educating the citizens of Medfield about the candidates seeking office to replace Representative Dan Winslow, who resigned in September. Today, we'll be interviewing Mr. Sean Dooley. Mr. Sean Dooley has extensive experience in, Sean, in town government, including serving as a firefighter, as town clerk, and on the school board. Mr. Dooley, um, could you please tell us why you're running for this particular office? Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate you having me here today and uh, giving me the ability to get out and get myself in front of more Medfield voters. I'm running for state rep primarily just because I believe in public service. I'm very passionate about public service and I have the philosophy of if you want something to be fixed, you can't just sit around on the sidelines and complain about it. You have to get in there and be willing to get your hands dirty and do whatever it takes to try to fix it. Um, as, you know, as town clerk, I've been able to accomplish a lot of things, same with on the school committee, and that's how I got involved in those, both of those positions. And so what I wanted to do was be able to continue this forward, and there's a lot of things to be fixed in the state, so I wanted to go up there and give it my best shot and work hard and be a full, you know, I'm going to be a full-time representative. I'm not, th this is not a, another part to my other job. I'll, you know, I'll be leaving as town clerk if I get, am I fortunate enough to get elected. And so this will be a full-time position, so I'll be able to spend the time meeting with, you know, townspeople and, and selectmen and business owners and make sure that the 9th Norfolk District is really, really well represented. Thank you. Now, Mr. Dooley, we have several additional questions for you. And if you could just take uh, three minutes to answer each, that'd be great. The State Senate recently approved a bill raising the minimum wage to $11 per an hour, the highest rate in the nation. The House of Representatives will likely take up this bill early next year. How would you vote on this as Medfield State Representative? And what else can we do to improve economic opportunity in the state? Okay. Um, the minimum wage, I do believe, needed to be increased. It was, it was, a, it was a very, very low rate, especially in the you know, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's hard to do anything at $8 an hour. But what I would personally would like to see, and I, and I would, if I'm able to be up there, I would propose an amendment to do it in stages as opposed to automatically increase it by 40% over the next three years to increase it by a dollar. And let's see how, let's sit back and uh, determine how that affects the small businesses, how it affects the economy, you know, how it, you know, does it help people, does it not help people, it does, is more needed, is that enough, as opposed to putting it in there and having it increase every single year for the next three years without any, any checks or any safeguards. You know, if all of a sudden it really starts to hurt small businesses and people are losing their jobs in our economy, you know, we're still coming out of a, you know, the recession, um, it creates more trouble and more uh, unemployment, then, then it's too late. Whereas if you, know, you increase it by a dollar and it looks good and it's working well, and the small business owners are happy and the, and the workers are happy, then we can build it from there. Um, what a lot of people don't talk about, everyone's like, oh, it's just big corporations like Walmart. You know, it's, it's, it's not true. There's a lot of small businesses that rely on, you know, especially for you know, high school kids and college kids, uh, minimum wage jobs that are untrained and aren't, aren't experts on things. But what you have to take into account is the compounding effect. If all of a sudden the minimum wage for someone that's untrained and has never done the job is $12, then that person who is currently earning $12 is going to want 16 and vice versa and so on and so on and so on that 16 an hour person it compounds up to 20 and so, and, and it kind of never ends um, and so that can be really really detrimental because I know if you know, I've worked hard for a company and I've gotten to the point where I'm earning $12 an hour and then all of someone someone comes in that has never done it and has never you know worked in the business or in the industry and I'm the one having to train them, then I'm going to want to get paid more. 
And so I think that's can, that could have a very significant effect on small businesses here. So, thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, next question. Due to a provision in the state constitution, Massachusetts is currently one of only nine states with a flat income tax rate. Opponents claim this is an outdated, regressive policy, but attempts to change the law at the ballot box have always failed by wide margins. Would you be in favor of amending the state constitution to allow for a progressive income tax rate? And also, should the 6.6.25% sales tax stay where it is? Okay. Um, no, I, I, I actually prefer the flat tax. I think it's, I think it's more uh, fair. Uh, people that make more money do pay more, you know, more in taxes, but it's even across the board. And I'm a big believer in everyone being treated uh, equally and fairly. In addition, there's you know, been a lot of studies that'll show the progressive tax rates, while great during when times are good and the economy is booming, when economies go down and we go into a recession or a depression, it's a significant, uh, more substantial drop for the tax base. And so it's much harder for the Commonwealth to prepare and plan and budget when there's going to be wider swings in the economy because uh, unfortunately, as we all know, our government tends to spend everything they get and then some. Um, so if we have a great year when everything's booming and people are making a ton of money and we have a progressive tax rate, you know, well, we have an extra billion dollars to play around with. Let's go ahead and play around with it. And then all of a sudden, you know, the bottom drops out and now we're $2 billion in the hole, but we've already spent and, you know, started using that money. So that's, that's one of the things I'm, um, I personally am worried about. Both the House and the Senate uh, up, in the, up in Beacon Hill took this on in April, and they both, um, both uh, houses determined that they did not want to proceed, it, proceed with looking at a progressive tax. So they're both in favor of uh, the current flat, flat tax. Um, I am in favor of reducing the state uh, sales tax back down to 5%. I think there is a lot of fraud and waste and abuse that's in the government right now that we can cut out. Um, you know, that's, you know, I know that's the opponent's argument that we need this money and we need this revenue. Uh, but especially for the businesses up on, on the North Shore, up on the New Hampshire border, it's, it's hard enough for them to can compete at, with a 5% sales tax when someone can go right across the border. You add it to 6.25%, then it's even worse. And when this was originally enacted, it was a stopgap measure anyways, and oh, don't worry, you know, as soon as things get back on track, we'll bring it back down. And that never happened. So I would like to see that come back down. And I'm fine with that going in stages as well. You know, maybe we'll do it a, a quarter of a percent and see how that goes. Then if we need, you know, then if we're still living and breathing and things are going well, then we can go another quarter and bring it all the way down. It doesn't have to be all at once. All right. All right. All right. Thanks. A study by the Massachusetts Taxpayer Foundation found that at the end of 2012, State and municipal retirement funds across the Commonwealth had $146 billion in unfunded liabilities, with $63 billion on hand and a gap of $83 billion. How do you plan to close this gap? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, ob obviously, it's an issue that really needs to be addressed, and it needs to be taken apart as, you know, I have a f background in finance, and a lot of the things that we have to look at our, is the efficiencies within government, the bureaucracy built around the retirement plan, make sure it's being invested well, to, you know, minimize some of the fees, and then we can step back and start looking at how to fix it going forward. Um, I don't believe in fixing it on the backs of our current retirees. Uh, Governor Patrick uh, just proposed a, a, a bill a while back, I think it's H59, uh, that allows for, to reopen retirement for you know the entire retirement system for their for the health insurance and while I think it should be on the table for future retirees current retirees to change their health system and what they're playing and, and their plan and everything like that when they've we've made an agreement with them in years back they, they worked and they retired at a certain level and in income and you know they and they trusted their the Commonwealth that this is where they're going to be for the rest of their life all of a sudden to pull the rug out from underneath them and change the deal, I don't think is fair. Um, but going forward, you know, let's look at you know, what can we tweak? Where can we have better efficiencies? Uh, you know, we've, we've done a good job in the past of uh, keeping people from double dipping and you know, getting two different you know, retirements in the same system. 
So we're, you know, that, that's been taken care of, but you know, we can continue on with that and make sure that people are not getting um, retirements that aren't, they're not eligible for and they don't get overinflated you know, the last three years on their job all of a sudden they get a you know a huge inflated salary because of a of a of a perk or a friend that wants to give them a a nice going away present um, and then that base bases their retirement on that so I think it needs to be streamlined and there's a lot of efficiencies that we can we can adjust and I think that's the best way to to fix it um, I wish there was an easy oh we'll just you know we'll change it from column A to column B and that would fix it but um, we're a lot better off than Rhode Island, so it's yeah, where their their system's about to completely implode. So, a lot of work to be done, but um, I think we can, we can do it. All right. Now, while Massachusetts has approached its goal of near universal health care coverage, costs for care have risen exorbitantly since 2006. What specific plan do you have to better keep costs under control? Well, as I said, if you know, in the, I, I was speaking to these guys in, uh, their, in, a, in a class prior to this, um, if, if I knew the answer to that, I would be a billionaire and I, I would be all set. Uh, Massachusetts plan is substantially better than Obamacare, I believe. Um, it's, it's, it's moving in the right, right direction. I think there are a lot of, again, efficiencies that we can work on. There's a lot of fraud. Um, there's a lot of people who are you know, working in the underground economy that are not participating in it, but are reaping all the benefits um, you know of the of, of the health care in Massachusetts and we need to make sure that gets streamlined and people are all paying their you know same rate and same fair share uh, but what I you know far as increasing uh, other efficiencies is that you know that's one of the big things that we can do and you know far as you know doing better negotiations um, you know with health care providers make sure we're having you know you know there isn't you know anyone abusing the system there aren't um, organizations out there that are uh, charging fees that are beyond what they should be charging um, you know and unfortunately that's the nature of the beast with any insurance but I think it's even harder when it's a not-for-profit and it's a state-run uh, program but in addition to not really answering your question but from a one of my fears of you know Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act is that it it's a cookie-cutter approach and what's right for Mississippi is not right for Massachusetts. We are very, very different. And you know, we have you know, phenomenal hospitals and great doctors and you know, uh, you know, it, it's just completely different and it's not a one size fit all. And what I think as a legislator, one of the things that I would concentrate on and focus on is, is pushing the federal mandate to allow the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to have more control and have the local option and be able to, all right, we'll take you know, Obamacare has this base plan, but we can add our bells and whistles and, and the, the add-ons that we want that are important to the people of Massachusetts and not be forced to take things that are not important to the people of Massachusetts and make sure we're as efficient as possible and we're not having to pay for, you know, other parts of the country's, you know, little, you know, personal, personal quirks without um, being compensated for it and f so. There, that was, that was a rambling answer, but there you go. That's fine. Hey. The state legislature is currently considering a bill that would raise the dropout age to 18. Is this a good idea? And what else can the state do to improve education? Is it a good idea? In theory, awesome. You know, but there, there, in, I'm chair of the school board, and granted I'm in, in, on the elementary side. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of the reading and you know, the magazines that come through. I haven't seen any study, and I, when I, when I um, got your, your original question, or I, I did a little research on it, and I couldn't find any studies that, by changing the law, it really has any effect whatsoever. Um, there does not seem to be you know, a change in, you know, in, in communities that have a mandatory dropout rate of you know, 18. There doesn't seem to be any difference in the dropout rate. In Massachusetts, you know, we are... We're, we're doing a good job of educating our kids, and it's getting better. Um, for the past several years in a row, our dropout rate has declined, and it's at the lowest point it's been in over 20 years. Um, so, so we are making progress. What I worry about is, you know, creating this law, even though it sounds good on paper, is it's another unfunded mandate. You know, how is how are the schools going to pay for it? How is the town of Medfield? You know, are we going to have an additional truant officer? Are we going to have to, um, you know, chase people around? And 
you know, is it even a problem in Medfield? Is it a problem in Norfolk? I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't heard of an epidemic of, you know, you know, 17 year olds, you know, dropping out of school and running around. Um, so, but now all of a sudden we have additional expenses and requirements and more paperwork and bureaucracy that we have to then report into the state. Um, the schools, as they are now, have to, you know, with the MCAS and, and all the other different systems, um, there's tons of paperwork that we have to do to add another layer of, you know, red tape onto things. Without a substantial benefit, then I wouldn't be for it. If they can prove to me that it's a substantial benefit and the cost, you know, works, then great. Um, how to improve education? Um, again, you know the the federal you know federal mandated situations. You know, Common Core is coming coming down the pipe, and in, in Massachusetts, this is Common Core state. It is again a federal cookie cutter program, and what's again what's right for Arkansas or Mississippi or whatever is not right for Massachusetts. We have, you know, currently the best education system in the country, and we need to encourage that and increase upon that and the MCAS is rigorous and and build upon that as opposed to taking our taking a federal system that's a one size fits all and try to you know round peg into a square hole and so what we really need to do is look at it objectively and see what's best for each community and give the power to the communities and for what's right for their students and what's important you know we talked about in, in you know in the class you know doing magnet schools you know, you got kids that are really interested in science and math and technology. You know, let's focus them toward those and, and make sure that we're able to do uh, everything that we can to encourage them to grow and succeed and become successful adults. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Casinos are facing significant hurdles to opening in Massachusetts as towns like Milford and East Boston vote down proposals. A grassroots advoc advocacy group called Repeal the Casino Deal has filed more than 90,000 signatures to halt gambling in the state. As Medfield's representative, where do you stand on casino gambling? Would you support efforts to open a casino anywhere within the district? Um, again, kind of a two, I'll give you a kind of a two-part answer. Um, would I support a, a casino in this district? Let me, I'll go, I'll go backwards first. Kind of falls under my same answer with my, uh, as far as the minimum wage. Let's phase it in. I, I'm not sure why we have to go all at once with you know three casinos and one slots parlor. You know, let's do one, and if all the wonderful things that everyone says that it's going to bring in all this tax revenue and there's going to be you know it's not going to hurt any crime or anything like that, then we're like, all right, great. Now we can do mm -hmm. a second one, and we'll you know I'm sure we made some mistakes with that first one. On the second one, we'll make it even better, and then build from there, and then do the third one, and then do the fourth one. But to do all of them all at once. Because if they are as bad as the opponents say, all of a sudden now we have, you know, one slots parlor, three major casinos, huge infrastructure, you know, cities and towns left, you know, left with a, you know, a complete mess. The company that comes in from Las Vegas that's putting this here all of a sudden says, all right, well, we're not making any money. I'm cutting my losses and I'm gone. And, you know, Milford or one of the other towns is stuck with this, you know, all the problems and none of the none of the revenue. So, again, I think it's better to be like, all right, if it's really that good, let's do them one at a time and see how it goes. Um, would I support a casino in the district or a, a slots parlor? Plainville has voted 80 percent um, at the at the Plain Ridge racetrack. Um, 80, almost 80 percent of the town voted that they want to have slots there. It's already a gambling venue. It's right off of 495. It's positioned well. If 80 percent of a of a town wants something in their thing, then I would support it as, as, their, as their representative. I would say, you know what, the, you know, the people have spoken. Let them go forward and, and let's, let's work. But, you know, let's make sure we're smart about it and we don't do, you know, anything stupid and we keep the, you know, you know an eye on it. You know, let's not just throw it in there and, and walk away. But let's make sure if that's what the people want and they already have the infrastructure in place for it, then, you know, then I think we should go forward with it. But it's, it's again, it's one of those things if, the community doesn't want it, then I would be against it. So, thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Medfield's other state rep, Denise Garlick, went to the State House with a background in nursing. As a result, she served on the committees of public and mental health, as well as worked on the health care cost containment bill. Is there a particular area of government where you think you can make a difference? Well, hopefully in all of them, but uh, uh, <laughs> the, um, 
my areas that I'm passionate about are, are, are obviously education and public safety. I'm on the fire department. I'm an EMT. And, and as a former small business owner, the economy and jobs. I've you know, spent a lot of time with you know, Representative Sean O'Connell, and she's working on a small business uh, owner's bill of rights uh, to eliminate some of the red tape and paperwork that, you know, that are face our small businesses, that are especially the startups, um, to grow and succeed. Because I think what's going to make the economy great is having small businesses grow and succeed and, and build from the ground up from a real grassroots level. Um, as of, you know, I think I have a pretty diverse background from the standpoint of, you know, I have, you know, you know 15 years in the financial services industry, I have a bunch of degrees and designations in, in that world. Then as a business owner, as a, you know, owning a, a construction company and swinging a hammer every day, I have that unique perspective. And then four years in municipal government, I've seen how all the different aspects of, uh, of those industries work and being able to bring that forward and having that level of expertise and, you know, you know, not against any of the lawyers up there, but I mean, I think we have, you know, and, and this isn't against my two opponents who are also lawyers, but I think we need to have more small business owners up there and people who have done other jobs. And, um, you know, just having um, a different perspective and being able to be, you know, when we're talking about a public safety bill, I, I, can, I can say, you know, listen, you know, this isn't what the union says or this isn't whatever. This is something I've personally experienced. Or as, as a business owner trying to start my business and, and, and keep people employed and put food on the table for my family, you know, this is, you know, this is some of the struggles that I felt and I faced and was very frustrating for me. Um, I think that brings a unique perspective um, to the position and hopefully I'd be able to relay that. Awesome. All right, thanks. Right now, Medfield is looking at several major construction projects, Dale Street School, the Police and Fire Department, as well as a possible new parks and recreation facility. These three deteriorating town infrastructures all need to be fixed now, but pose a tremendous cost to the town. What can the state do to help Medfield and other cities and towns seeking to undertake public works projects? Well, I mean, there, there, are, there are quite a few grants out there. There are different programs. You know, the Massachusetts School Building Authority um, does a great job. When, you know, when, you, when if a city and town votes, and the people understand that this is going to be the cost, and this is what we want to do, and we want to invest in our in our town and build this new school, and it goes before the ballot, it's a ballot initiative, and the people vote for it. You know, at town meeting, and then it gets on the ballot, and it and it gets approved, and you partner up with the MSBA. And they're bringing roughly 50 cents to the dollar on there, and it's a great opportunity. Um, and as a state rep, I would help facilitate that. I would, you know, help meet with those, write letters, and make calls, and kick and scream, and do whatever it takes to make sure that you guys get every single thing that is out there. And there's other federal grants and public and private grants, especially for you know on the recreation side. There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, even from a you know, silly standpoint, CVS has a shade grant um, that um, you know, for for doing shade structures during re during recreation because they have a, a big uh, skin cancer anti skin cancer campaign going on. So you you want to look at all those things, and I think as a as a legislator, you can bring all these different groups together and help um, you know bring the school committee together and bring the selectmen and bring the town administrator and bring parks and rec and find out create a long term plan. Being like, all right, look. You know, the town can't afford to do all of these at once. It would be wonderful if we had a money tree and we could do it, but we can't. So where can we get the best bang for our buck? You know, if we can get, you know, the fire station paid for and there's enough grants there that we can do, you know, 50% of it and there's nothing over in the MSBA, you know what, let's concentrate there. And then a, a year from now we can concentrate on the schools or, or wherever else we can get our, um, you know, the best, best value. And you know, long-term rate of return on the uh, on the investment. Obviously, if there's something completely falling down and you, we don't have a choice, then you do what you can and and you and you work hard and you know and that's where you really kind of have to get a little more creative. But you know, if all things were equal, you pick and choose. And you need to create a long-term plan that you know. This year we're doing this. Two years from now we're doing that. Five years now if we're doing that. Ten years now we're doing from that. So. All right. All right. Since its closure in 2003, Medfield State Hospital has stuttered, uh, shuttered, and closed 
atop 75,000 tons of toxic waste. The selectmen have approved the cleanup plan proposed by the mediation between the state and the town. The state is offering to sell to the town approximately 135 acres of the remaining 225 acres. After that, what do you see as the future for the hospital? Well, as, I, as, as we talked about earlier, um, you know, the future really should be in the hands of the residents of Medfield. It's a, you know, if I were a Medfield resident, I would vote to um, control the project as opposed to having the state sell it somewhere else. But we, you know, we have to make sure that we're able to get all the numbers. You know, if you know, oh, we're going to buy it for $2 million, but it's going to cost us $30 million to clean it up, you know, further and, and get the asbestos out of the buildings or tear down the buildings or remodel the buildings, you know, then we need to, you know, know that and just let the public understand where it is. But, you know, giving it over, letting the state just sell it to a developer who, who knows what, is going, to, is going to do whether he ends up putting in you know 40b or you know you know big development and you know we don't know how it works in with the school system and all of a sudden it creates a we have an influx of 500 additional children into the school system that we can't afford or house or anything like that then it's not good whereas if we own it and control it then you can make the right decisions going forward um, you know I've you know I've met with you know Bill and I've, the, the visioning committee I've sat in on, on one of their ma meetings and um, you know, Richard Sarga and you know, Pete Peterson have all, you know, we've kind of taken the tours and gone all these things. They've done a phenomenal job with DCAM and, you know, determining, um, you know, some of the cleanup and they've gotten much more than, you know, the Westboro State Hospital, which is a current, another similar size project um, that's currently working and it's working very well for the, for the town of Westboro. Um, but there's, you know, you know, it's a beautiful property. You know, the, you know, the cleanup that they've negotiated down on the river with, you know, being able to have a place to launch canoes and, and kayaks from, and it's, I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. And the entire property, just even with the, the structure of the buildings, is great. You know, I hope they're able to, you know, it's able to work financially, and I think it could be a real jewel for the town of Medfield, and I think it's one of the most important things there. As a rep, I would continue to fight um, for additional funds for cleaning up, um, you know, especially for any surprises, you know, if you know, Medfield buys it and, you know, you know, three years from now, they're you know, they're tearing down X, Y, and Z building, and all of a sudden there comes something there that no one knew about, some sort of bizarre toxic waste. You know, it, was, it was the state hospital, it wasn't Medfield's hospital. It's you know they they owe a certain level of responsibility and ownership for that, even though we've you know negotiated and, and Bill Massaro has done a phenomenal job you know in the mediation uh, of getting everything. You know we can, and it's the state's spending a lot of money on it, and it's going to be a great project. But you know, if there are surprises down the road, the legislator needs to be able to get in there and fight and say, "Listen, this is right. You know, we got to do what's right for the people of Medfield. We got to make sure that you know these whatever doesn't you know, affect the water table. It doesn't you know it doesn't hurt things, and that it becomes a very very successful addition to the community as opposed to a blight in the community or something that." You know, that hurts the town, hurts the schools, creates a negative tax base, creates too much traffic. You know, you know, all of those things can be taken into account, and I think that's one of the main advantages of the town buying it and controlling it. And you know, you guys have done a great job having a visioning committee to go look forward of what the best use is for it. So instead of just taking the quick dollar tomorrow, it's a long-term investment in Medfield's history and 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 200 years from now, it'll still be uh, paying rewards. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Uh, one more question. You have had a long history of political involvement. What from your past do you think has best prepared you to represent Medfield in the State House? Best. Um, I don't know if there's one thing I could say that would be the best thing that pre prepared me. Um, in every single, there is a consistent thing that has prepared me, and in every job I've ever done, and it, you know, my little symbol is a smiley face. My theme has always been service with a smile. I try to be very, very accessible. I like meeting with people. It's going to sound cliche. I like people. Um, I have, you know, you know, very outgoing personality, and I want to be able to help people, whether it's. You know, they need a tour of the state house because their cousin's in from, you know, Walla Walla, Washington, or, you know, they have an issue with a child that has special needs. 
you know, whatever it is, I think I want to be able to be able to be there and be reachable, accessible people to know me and go to the, you know, Eagle Scout, you know, Court of Honor, and you know, and know the people of the town and 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 have you know monthly meetings in in town hall, you know, open you know, open door sessions where people from the town can come and. It, gives me also an opportunity to make sure I'm there every single month to meet with the town manager and find out what's going on and take the pulse of the of the town. So I think that's what I would bring to it that I honestly care. You know, best thing about being a, you know, on the fire department at EMT is I get to help people and, you know, at their hour of need and, and be there and really, really, you know, do a hands-on, you know, helping. You know, all the other things are great too, you know, being you know, on the school committee and helping kids succeed and and you know, as you know, town clerk getting people, you know, make sure the elections run and all that sort of stuff. But it all comes down to people helping people, and I think that's what I really, really enjoy, and I think that's what I would bring to um, my service as a state rep. Nice. Now we would like you to conclude this portion of the program with final closing remarks. Just three minutes for your thoughts. Just three minutes for my thoughts. Okay. Well, I, I really appreciate penny, uh, penny for my thoughts. Um, I really appreciate you having me here. I appreciate the people of Medfield, uh, Medfield Television, uh, having me here. Uh, thank you for, to the League of Women Voters of Medfield uh, for putting this on, and, and for you guys for, and, and the, you know, all the students of Medfield High School uh, for for inviting me here today, and letting me introduce myself to the people of Medfield. Um, my easiest place to find me is uh, my website. It's duly, then the number four, rep.com. And I would really appreciate your vote. I will work very hard for you. I will do everything I can uh, if I'm elected your state rep representative to represent Medfield, you know, not just precincts three and four, but all of Medfield. Uh, rising tide raises all boats. What's good for, good for one is good for, for the town as a whole. And I would really appreciate the opportunity to serve you and thank you very much. Thank you. No, thanks. Is that it? Uh, yep. You, you, anything else? No? No? You good? Not for you. No, not for me. <laughs> and no accents. You didn't do a single accent. Oh, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> I, mean, I really just meant to pull it off, but it never occurred to me. Now, to verify that you are an active voter or to determine where your precinct is in Medfield, log on to Town of Medfield, MA, slash Town Services, slash Town Clerk, slash Voter Information, slash Am I registered to vote? Enter your information, your last name, your first name, and your birth date, and click search. You'll be told if you are active, what party you are affiliated with, or if you are unenrolled in what precinct you are in. Remember, this special election is for six towns. In Medfield, this election is for precincts three and four only. The special election primary is on Tuesday, December 10th, and the special election general election is on January, January 7th. I'm Andy Latai, this is James Callahan, and thank you for joining us today. Be sure to see all three of our interviews and be sure to vote. Thank you for listening. This program was made possible through the generous support of your Medfield friends and neighbors, folks just like you. And thanks for watching.